It's important news for the 8.4 million Canadians collecting the Canada Emergency Relief Benefit. The federal government wants to tighten the rules around eligibility and crack down on fraudulent applications. They're going to do that through a bill that will be tabled in the House of Commons tomorrow, though opposition parties are already voicing concerns. Many Canadians max out, of course, on the CERB this month or even into July. So what happens to them? Jean-Yves Duclos is the president of the Treasury Board. He joins us from the foyer of the House of Commons. Hi, Mr. Duclos. Good to see you again. Good afternoon, Vashti, and good afternoon to everyone listening. I know that the legislation has not formally been tabled, but parts of it have been leaked to the media. So I do want to ask you about that and, and specifically the, the penalties that it lays out for people who, and I want to quote this specifically, include information that is false or misleading in their applications for the CERB and for those who knowingly failed to disclose sources of income or other relevant facts when they applied for that federal aid. You're threatening them with penalties of triple the amount that they received. Why didn't your government signal that you plan to do that at the outset? Opposition parties are saying you misled Canadians. Well, thank you, Avashi. And I would propose two keywords. First, the vigor, and second, the rigor of our measures, including the CERB. We've been very clear that Canadians expected us to act quickly in support of the difficulties that they are facing, they've been facing since the start of COVID-19. But from the very start, we said that this would be in a rigorous manner. We told Canadians that we expected all of them, or at least a vast majority of them, to keep being honest when they transact with the government. What we let everyone know that there would be uh, initially back end and now uh, a lot more explicit measures to make sure that those very few Canadians that are that may be thinking or that might have fraud the system that there will be severe pen penalties uh, for that. I have to challenge you on the premise that, that you're laying out there, that, that you somehow signal to Canadians that they should anticipate this. I want to repeat for you something that Minister Qualtro said on this program uh, last month. There's not going to be penalties, and we're not going to punish people if they did it in good faith. There was no threat at the time that all these articles were coming out, specifically through first through the National Post, about the possibility of fraudulent claims. There was no word from your government that they might be facing jail time at one point or $5,000 fines or triple what they owed. You, you were not signaling that. What, what you said, Vashti, is extremely important. Good faith. The vast majority of mistakes that were made were made in good faith and there will be no penalty and no consequences for that because the vast majority of mistakes that were made by Canadians were made in a very uh, natural framework. No, it was difficult for them, for many of them to understand how the system was working. So they made mistakes in good faith and they will face no penalties. But there are very few, but unfortunately there are Canadians that we've seen in the last few days that are uh, started, that have started to try to fraud the system. And for these Canadians, there will be penalties. How many uh, fraudulent claims have there been for the CERB thus far, Minister? Well, I wouldn't know uh, the, the number. I couldn't certainly speak about the precise cases. But what we know and what has been indeed uh, discussed and reported in the media is that there are some instances, unfortunately, of Canadians trying to fraud the system. That's always the case. You know, credit card fraud, the banking account fraud, those unfortunately occur uh, almost every day. And it's the case also for government support, especially in an emergency context. So, so you have no idea of the specific numbers because you are saying you're characterizing it as very few people. How do you know that for sure? Well, we, we know that from uh, previous uh, experiences of, this, of CRA, CRA being, being the Canada, Canada Revenue Agency as well as Service Canada. These agencies, these agencies are not only very strong, but very experienced in, in dealing with uh, cases of fraud in other contexts, of, uh, of course, in EI, employment insurance, and in uh, income tax uh, payments and statements. So these agencies are very strong. They know approximately the proportion of cases where fraud is typically found, and we expect those cases to be relatively few. In this context, though, so, so I just want to be, make sure I'm clear, the government does not have a number for how many fraudulent applications have been made at this point. Is that correct? Well, it's an evolving number. Of course, those numbers uh, change continuously uh, because of all sorts of reasons. Because A, first, because more information is currently now obtained by, uh, by CRA and by Service Canada. And second, there are increasing uh, efforts on their part to go beyond the, ur the urgency and emergency context in which we were initially towards a more integrity context, which is normal after 
we have uh, delivered that emergency support. Uh, yeah, I understand, Minister, that it's, that it's evolving, certainly, and that there'll be no, new information. But I'm just trying to make sure our viewers have an idea, because you're, you're, the Prime Minister has said it's 1% to 2%. Uh, the, the Minister of Employment said it's less than 200,000. Like, how, how widespread is the problem of fraud that you feel, that your government feels, is necessary to address through this legislation tomorrow? You well, that's correct. It. The Prime Minister did say uh, about 1%, which is the typical uh, proportion of fraud that we find in most cases. But of course, CERB is not a, new, a usual case. So we're starting from a very new program, an emergency program, where we, we thought it was very important to do things quickly and efficiently. And that therefore leaves open the question of how much at the end, how many at the end there will be uh, cases of fraud. Okay, but, but more to the point, and respectfully, you can't tell me exactly how much fraud the, the system has seen so far. I do want to move on because one of your party's own MPs, Adam Vaughn, was tweeting about this announcement, or, or what's to come, rather, in the legislation and some of what the Prime Minister said today about what will be in that legislation as far as fraud grows. And I want to read part of what he wrote on Twitter. It's Adam Vaughn. I do not and will not support jailing people for CERB. CERB overpayments can be reconciled through the tax system. Deliberate and organized fraud can be dealt with through existing laws. Is he wrong? Well, that's, that's correct. Uh, in, in fact, we are not going to go after people who have made mistakes in good faith. No, this is, this is clear from the very start. Minister Qualtro, as you said, mentioned it a couple of times. Prime Minister also mentioned it. It's, it's there. This, this, these fraud clauses are there for cases of fraud. And we know there will be few, but we know we need to, the tools to fight them. What's an example of fraud versus just a simple mistake? Well, a fraud would be someone or a group of people deliberately uh, giving false information or organizing themselves in order to get other people commit, uh, commit fraud, you know, pro providing information to their personal benefit in a manner which is completely uh, based on bad faith. So that's why we need those cases of fraud to be appropriately uh, fought by the, uh, by the government. That's why those measures are absolutely needed. Uh, Minister, there is also a request from the NDP to extend the CERB. We do know that many of the 8 million uh, Canadians who applied for the CERB, or I think a quarter of them, some economists have assessed, will be reaching the end of the four-month period of eligibility in July. Uh, are you prepared to extend that benefit? Well, those conversations are absolutely important. We know the CERB was there to help in an emergency context. We also know, and again, the Prime Minister has stated repeatedly that the, the wage subsidies in particular are there to replace progressively uh, the, the CERB. But we understand and, and feel and hear that there are many Canadians that are still struggling to try to find appropriate work. So we'll be there to, have, to, be, we'll be there to help them. We'll have their backs. Can, can you uh, tell those Canadians who are concerned about that very subject that, that you lay out and, and their ability to get through the summer, exactly when they will know how you will have their backs? Well, we have their, we've, had, we've had their backs since the beginning and will continue to do so because it's absolutely important. If we want to go through this crisis, we need everyone to go through it. It's, a, it's absolutely essential that we maintain both the economic and the social integrity of our country. And that's why very soon the Prime Minister, obviously, and the Minister of Finance, Minister Qualtrough, and many others are working very strongly in order to, to not only to, to find the future, but also to work with everyone else to get to that future. Do you anticipate you'll have those details by the end of the week? And, and I don't ask you know, facetiously or anything. I know that there are a lot of Canadians who are worried that this benefit runs out for them in the next month, and they are trying to figure out how they're going to get through the summer. So will you let them know how by the end of this week? Yes, and we know the, the, the very important sources of anxiety that people are going through. That's why we are working very hard and very actively. And I would say, I would like to tell you now, Vashi, what the, the, the future will be, but I will uh, ask for your patience, uh, knowing, however, that we are working very hard. Minister Qualtrough, Minister Mono, Minister Le Boutillier, the Prime Minister, uh, will uh, very quickly uh, let every Canadian know the path forward. Okay, I'll leave it there, Minister. Thank you very much for your time this evening. Thank you, Vashi. Well, let's get some opposition reaction to the government, which is expected to introduce legislation tomorrow that proposes penalties for Canadians who fraudulently apply for emergency COVID-19 benefits. The NDP argues this would penalize vulnerable Canadians who may have applied for the wrong benefit because the process was confusing. The NDP also says that emergency benefit should be extended another four months since many people max out on it soon. Let's bring in the leader of the NDP, Jagmeet Singh. He joins us now from the foyer of the House of Commons. Hi, Mr. Singh. Good to see 
see you again. Hey, good to see you as well. So I, I, before I get into what the government is proposing with penalties um, and the, the legislation that's coming up, I do want to ask you about this, sir, because I asked the minister about what your party is asking for, and that is the proposal to extend the CERB by four months. And I just want to be clear. I mean, the program has already cost $43 billion. It had a huge uptake, 8 million Canadians. Are you proposing that the Fed spend another $43 billion? Well, what I'm proposing is right now for a lot of families, there is uncertainty about going back to work. They're not certain if they can actually find work or, or any place for them to continue to earn something to put food on the table for their families. With that uncertainty, what we're calling on the government to do is extend CERB for the time being. We can reevaluate when people are, are able to go back to work. But at a minimum, let's give families some confidence that they will have some supports until the time comes when the economy really reopens so that people can get back to work. And so that's why I'm calling for an extension. That's really vital. Families right now are on the hook. We share the story of Kirsten, who is an education worker, who is not certain if she will be able to go back to work until schools reopen. Her school, the where, she, where she works, does not qualify for the wage subsidy. So she's really pleading that the CERB continue until she can go back to work. Is there a way to do it that addresses the concerns that you're putting forth, but also addresses the concerns we've heard from, for example, some business owners or premiers of provinces who are worried because of a, a lower uptake, let's say, on the wage subsidy or a difficulty in getting people back to work? Like, is there a middle ground here? Does it have to be the CERB as it is for the next four months? Well, I think that to get people uh, comfortable to work, really, there's just three things needed. Work needs to be safe. Workers want to go back to work. They need to know that they're safe. There needs to be paid sick leave in place. And childcare, as we heard from earlier, uh, that's a massive concern for families. They don't know if their kids will be cared for. So if we have those three things in place, people certainly want to go back to work. But we need to have those conditions met before people can work. But they are being met in a number of provinces. And that's why I'm asking you again. Like, this is a big, I'm asking because it's a big price tag, right? I understand the necessity for it. I hear from people who still need it too. That's why I asked the minister what they plan to do and when they're going to tell Canadians. But it's also another, you know, $43 billion potentially on, on top of a deficit that's already at $260 billion. I just think it would be devastating for families that have no way to go to work and no uh, CERB coming in where they would be left. I think that cost of families falling through the cracks in such a devastating way, they would lose potentially their homes. It would create not only a homelessness crisis, but a potential public health risk there where people don't know where they will live and how they would pay for the necessities of life. I think that is too big of a crisis and too big of a disaster for us not to put in place some security for families to know that CERB will be extended. And then we can reevaluate that once uh, economies open up, once provinces do open up and it is safe to go back to work, maybe we can reevaluate it. But for the short term, we certainly need to expand CERB. I think there is no question that it should be extended. But but again, provinces are reopening right now. And I just think like as the government, don't they have to balance out? I take your point that the need is acute right now, but also those same families are going to have to eventually one day pay it back, be it through higher taxes or, or whatever means necessary. So it's not as though the cost isn't borne by them eventually. Uh, is there a way to sort of augment the need for it now with, for example, some of the things we see in the EI program? Like is there a, a different type of program that the government could design that you might be supportive of? Well, I just think that people will work if work is safe, if there's childcare in place and there's paid sick leave in, in place. If those things are met, people will certainly go to work. And right now, the people who are asking for the extension are those who, who don't have a place to work, people who work in the entertainment, the festival, the service sector, where a lot of their jobs are very uncertain, people who work in, in places where they need to come together, so teaching and work places which require groups coming together, we know that it's going to be difficult. So those families need some security to know that they're actually going to be able to pay the bills. And I think that's exactly the role of government to ensure that those folks aren't left out without any support and without any opportunity to work. Okay, on the subject of penalties, and that yes. is the portion of the legislation. It's still to be tabled, just to explain to our viewers, but l parts of it have been leaked to the media, and that's those parts really revolve around what the government plans to do around fraudulent claims. And there's sort of two ways they're going to address it. Fraudulent claims going forward with, with different uh, restrictions on eligibility, and that can be punishment, you know, a $5,000 fine or jail, and then, uh, you know, a fine of basically having to pay three up to three times back if you've, if you've fraudulently applied in the past. The government, and, and we spoke to the minister, is basically saying, look, if, if you made a mistake, you're not going to be punished for it. 
if you committed fraud, you will be punished. Doesn't that, don't you think that will make sense to most Canadians? Well, first off, there's already very powerful fraud laws that exist. So when, when the government creates a whole new offense, what's going to happen is it's going to disproportionately impact marginalized people, racialized people, those who are already vulnerable. There's already robust laws around people stealing someone's identity. And what's happening here is people who've applied to the CERB who were encouraged to do so because a minister said, do it. If you do it in good faith, you'll be okay. Because a, a parliamentary secretary, Adam Vaughan, said, yes, go out and apply. And then to put a potential criminal jeopardy in place, what that's essentially doing is someone who was on the boundary. They were making, maybe they were at the $4,900 instead of the $5,000 cutting cutoff point. Maybe instead of losing their job, a job was ready for them, but it was no longer available because of COVID-19. So they didn't meet the exact definition. These are people that are not just facing, oh, you made a mistake. Uh, they're facing potentially going to jail or a massive fine over a minor technicality. That to me is the wrong approach in the pandemic. Uh, and at the same time, while the government's willing to put jail term and penalties, massive financial penalties in place for people who are getting $2,000, they allow billionaires and millionaires who cheat the system to the tune of billions of dollars, they're completely off the hook. That that's approach a, to me is absolutely though, wrong. That's not a completely fair statement. I mean, they have invested, I think it was uh, up to $10 billion with the CRA, my, correct me if my memory is serving me wrong, over a number of years, over 10 years, to go after people who are evading taxes. They're not completely absent of, of the responsibilities there. Uh, they're absolutely absent of the responsibility. They've allowed the CRA very clearly went after Loblaws for $360 million of unpaid taxes. $360 million unpaid taxes. And the court found that it was legal what they were doing. They were hiding their money offshore completely legally. So the government allows people billionaires and millionaires, though they, those are the only ones who are doing this, to hide their money and to starve the Canadian government and, and, our, and all Canadians of billions of dollars, but they're going after people who might have said, oh, I, I earned $4,900 instead of $5,000, and they applied. Someone who didn't lose their job but had a job ready but it was no longer there. Those folks technically that would be considered not truthful because they're, they're you know, being loose with the definition. Those people would have a jeopardy of going to jail, whereas Loblaws, who effectively stole $360 million from the coffers of the Canadian government, the CRA actually went after them, but was found to be legally okay to do that. That, to me, is a stark example of the unfairness and injustice that the government's willing to go after people who are desperate, but letting billionaires and millionaires completely off the hook when it comes to offshore tax havens. And I, 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 and I mean completely off the hook. I take that point, but it, it, should the government do nothing about people who tried to, to, to fraud this, defraud the system in, in the case of the CERB? Like, should there be no penalties if actual fraud is determined? Well, if you're talking about fraud as in, you know, high, using someone else's identity, fraud in terms of fabricating documents, all those laws exist right now. People go to jail all the time for that type of fraud. We're talking about creating a penalty for people who apply for a social benefit, a unique criminal penalty. That to me is heartless. And, and in fact, frankly, disgusting given people are desperate in a pandemic, needed to apply for some help, and there's existing laws in place. If someone has stole someone's identity, there's criminal laws in place for them to be prosecuted. If someone made up a completely fabricated story, there's criminal laws in place that have existed before. But to create a brand new penalty to go after people who applied for $2,000 because they were in need during a pandemic, but letting billionaires and millionaires use offshore tax havens, that to me, that contrast is frankly completely unjustified and, and disgusting that the government would not go after those billionaires and millionaires, would but go after someone who's struggling to put food on the table. I've just got about a minute left, but does this mean if this stays in the bill as is, as it's introduced tomorrow, this, this explicitly is in it, is there any way you support the bill? I don't see any ability to support a bill that creates a penalty for people who beyond the existing fraud laws, which already exist, but to create a brand new penalty to go after you know, people that are struggling because they're in a pandemic and couldn't find a way to earn money and they needed some help from the government, to go after them, uh, to me, is just not something that I could support So that has to be completely removed in order to support Absolutely. it. Okay. Absolutely. Okay, I'm gonna leave it there. Thank you very much, Mr. Singh. Appreciate your time this evening. Thank you. News of a draft bill coming tomorrow that would penalize fraudulent users of the government's emergency COVID-19 benefits led to two very different takes from Prime Minister Justin Trudeau and NDP leader Jagmeet Singh. Take a listen. We always knew from the beginning that uh, there would be mistakes and indeed that there would be a small number of fraudsters who would try to take advantage of it. When they passed that motion in the House, 
That was a commitment made by the Prime Minister directly to Canadians that people would not be penalized. We're not looking at punishing people who made honest mistakes. He's drafting a bill that's going to penalize potentially people who applied in good faith but maybe didn't meet a certain criteria. That is wrong. We've put measures in place that will allow us to go after the deliberate fraudsters who are trying to game the system for, uh, for criminal benefits. They're, they're effectively opening up the floodgates to retroactively charging people just for applying. So which is it, a broken promise that will punish people who applied in good faith or a measure that was always coming to ensure tax dollars aren't abused? Let's bring in the power panel to weigh in on that question. Amanda Alvaro of Pomp and Circumstance joins us from Toronto, also in that city, senior consultant with Navigator Shakir Chambers. And political commentator and former NDP MP Francoise Boivin joins us from Gatineau. Hi, everybody. Hi. Great to see you. Uh, Shakir, why don't I start with you? Because the, the chatter, of course, is, and I'm sure you, you'll know this, that, that this is all aimed at appeasing Conservatives' concerns, uh, the party's <laughs> concerns around fraud, and hoping to secure their support for maybe this legislation or parts of it. What do you think about that? Uh, I don't think the Conservatives are going to support fast-tracking any Liberal legislation. I think when you look at Mr. Scheer, as you said, Mr. Scheer and the Conservatives kind of wanted to address this earlier on when the CRB was rolled out. It was kind of swept under the rug as minor details. There are reports of uh, over 200,000 potentially fraudulent claims really wasn't addressed. So I think the view here is pretty much uh, there was a lot of miscommunication from the Liberals as far as who qualifies for what, how to apply for these programs, and they're really overcorrecting or co course correcting with draconian measures. While it's good to see them tackle fraud, I think more so the, the Conservatives wanted to have Parliament, right? Holding Parliament would have helped set proper parameters for the bill and kind of move this forward in a proper way. And I think as of right now, we're just looking at the Liberals kind of, again, uh, backtracking from some of the miscommunication they had earlier on with these programs. What do you think about those points, Amanda? Do you think that the, the Liberals are trying to appease the Conservatives here, or, or is there something more at play? No, I mean, I think there's a few things. I think coming out of the gate, COVID struck, and there wasn't a lot of time, and people found themselves out of work and without money. And it was most important to get checks into the hands of Canadians who really needed it, who needed to buy food or pay for expenses. And that was paramount. That was more important than putting this through a rigorous application process or leaving people high and dry at a time when the entire country was trying to figure out how we were going to weather this storm together. So the government took what has been broadly described as an umbrella approach get as many checks to as many people as quickly as possible. There was an application process, and, and I think reasonably, Canadians are asking at this point, ta taxpayers are asking, how do we deal with any fraudulent claims? And how do we make sure that there is an incentive for people to get back to work? So when I hear Jagmeet Singh's um, response today, and he says, listen, what is wrong? The wrong thing would be to punish those people who unknowingly made a mistake and made a claim potentially for both the wage subsidy and CERB. And I think the government agrees. It's not about punishing people who made honest mistakes. It's about fraudsters who deliberately defrauded the system. There has to be a consequence for that action. And, and I think to, to that point, uh, Francois, Mr. Singh, and, and that's the question that I put to him as well, Amanda, the, 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 he, his, he insists that there already are laws against fraud that, that, could, uh, that p fraudsters could face in this instance. Why do you need to come up with a whole specific set of punishments for people that you know he's dis he he describes as desperate at that time and may you know it may quote have been willful but it may have been out of desperation because they were a couple dollars off of the parameters the government had been set had set when I just read some of the articles that uh, circulated today or read social media, I was kind of wondering what his message was, uh, Mr. Singh. Uh, was it uh, hinting? At first, I thought, is he hinting that those who are frauding are either poor? And, and I'm like, oh, let's not open that can of worm uh, or racialize or in uh, First Nations and so on. Um, now I understand a bit more uh, what his uh, train of thought is on the matter. The problem lies with the prime minister 
minister, in my opinion, for the simple fact that if it's just to see where the program is going, because the four-month period, you said it, is, is going to be over. It, a lot of people already applied for the fourth uh, uh, period, so they have to decide because the emergency is still there. There's still a lot of people not having uh, uh, any ways to have a, a, a ends meet and, and, and so on. So um, instead of saying, here's the follow-up and where we're going, all today was about fines, almost like a law and order type of uh, announcement from this uh, this government. And let's not forget all the months prior that were devo uh, devoted by the prime minister standing day in, day out, every day of the week at 11, pretty much sharp, not so much at the beginning, but to tell us what they were going <laughs> to do, that they were there for people, that they would be doing this and, and, and that, and not a care in the world about how it would it would go. Uh, at the same time, I think it's a big political game that is being played. I think it's a smart game from the Liberals because who was complaining the most about fraud and, and, and this government not exactly knowing where it was going are the Conservatives. So now the Conservatives will be faced. I don't think the Liberals want the support of the NDP on that measure necessarily. They want they want to corner, so it's not it's not an answer to the conservatives. They're they're a bit cornered. If they go against it, then they can complain that this government uh, presented a, a, a piece of legislation that uh, had uh, fraud possibilities all written into it. Although, if uh, by the way, little advice for anybody would be sued by by the government on 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 getting served, just quote Andy Vaughan, the MP, and, and 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 encourage at the time. Time. And Adam, exactly, sorry, uh, encourage people to, to, to go for it, either if they needed it or not, and, and added to it today by saying uh, you will not vote for the legislation uh, unless you're somebody like a horse in Alabama, I'm quoting, I'm paraphrasing, but it was quite the quote. Yeah, Oklahoma. Uh, it has to be something like really huge. Yeah, the, the initial tweet that he put out, and, and I will say that Minister Qualtro, uh, Shakir eventually uh, on this show said that, I think, I think she used the term flippant to describe it, but he said, don't overreact. He had retweeted someone else who was concerned about the parameters around CERB, don't overreact and impose strict literal interpretations to what is a relatively easy attestation to make. So I, I do understand why there mm -hmm. are some people who maybe thought the parameters were more wide than they are. But I also take the Liberals' point uh, that there are, you know, if there's fraud, then, you know, fraud is different than ma making an innocent mistake. And, and there could be uh, penalties for that. I, see, I, I sort of see both sides of the argument. To the point, though, that Francoise was making about whether or not this paints the Conservatives in into a corner. I, I've been trying to trying to ascertain whether this changes their position because you're right, Shakir. They have already said, unless Parliament can really resume and we can debate this stuff for real, we're not really willing to support this. I had wondered if this would change their position at all or would force them to change it. I, I don't have any indications yet that that'll be the case. I don't know what you think. Yeah, no, I totally agree. I think the, the, the Conservatives have said if we're not holding a, a full session of Parliament, there's no way we're fast-tracking any more liberal legislation. I think that the position is pretty, is pretty simple, right? If you want to discuss these things, if you want to have uh, legislation move forward, let's be able to debate, let's ask questions, make sure we do this properly. We're not going to sit down for a day or two, fast-track this stuff through the House just so we can get it passed so the Liberals can have a summer break. I, I don't think the Conservatives have changed their position since. I haven't heard anything different either. We shall see tomorrow. I'm going to take a quick commercial break, but we're going to keep talking about this. Stay with us. More Power Panel on the other end of that break. You're watching Power and Politics on CBC News Network. Welcome back to Power and Politics with the Power Panel. Amanda Alvaro, Shakir Chambers, and Francoise Boivin. We have been talking about the government's financial aid measures and what happens in this kind of next phase of them. Amanda, I wanted to get your take on the sort of second half of the conversation, not just around uh, fraudulent CERB claims, but what happens with the CERB now? Because that's another thing that the NDP is predicating its potential support of this legislation on just pure extending the CERB for the next mm -hmm. four months. Uh, the government says they're going to come up with something and they're going to tell Canadians soon, but Minister Duclos couldn't give me an exact date. I mean, this is an important issue for a lot of Canadians who are running mm -hmm. out of this benefit, right? Who are coming up against mm -hmm. the end of that four month period. It's not everyone, but it's certainly a mm -hmm. portion of the Canadians who accessed it. What do you think the, the sort of decision making is like for the government in trying to figure out what they do next? 
Yeah, well, I think there's a few things at play. I think one, um, the bill itself addresses more than the penalties or fines associated with those fraudsters who knowingly and deliberately defraud the system. It's also about changing the application mm -hmm. period from a four-week period to a two-week period. And it's also about making sure that anyone who's eligible to return to work when they're called back to work do so. So there's a few things in place to move things along in order to get people back to work. And part of this is obviously hinged on the fact that many of the provinces, including now Ontario as of Friday, is heading into phase two. So more businesses are opening. I think what the government is hoping is that there will be more adoption of the wage subsidy. So one of the challenges at place is the fact that the wage subsidy hasn't been as adopted yeah. as they had previously expected. So employers, um, you know, getting employees back to work, rehiring those employees, utilizing the wage subsidy so that people don't require CERB. And it gives them a better, I think, baseline then to understand what those true needs are. That's going to take a little bit of time, but I think it's part of the reason why they want to move from that four-week to two-week period, because it gives them some wiggle room. If you're on a two-week application and you're able to go back to work for the back half of, of the month, that's a lot of dollars for a lot of people, a lot of taxpayer dollars that will be saved. Yeah, and I, and it's interesting because, Francoise, I get what, what Mr. Singh is saying in that there are a lot of people who still need it. But but I also understand, like, it, he, you know, he's saying the economy has to be back open. We have to, be, people have to feel safe. And, and I think we're just, we, we aren't where we were three months ago, right? Like, it's much, many, I, I'm reading, you know, scripts here saying that Alberta is opening up casinos on Friday. Uh, you know, daycares <laughs> are opening in Ontario. Like, things are not, certainly not at full blast, not anywhere close. But they really aren't at that sort of stagnant point that they were three months ago. So just extending it exactly as it is for four months, that's, that's a tough, I think it's a tough pill to swallow given I, I know the need is there, but maybe not to the degree it was three months ago. I don't know. Uh, complete. Uh, I, I totally agree with uh, the premise that you just stated. Uh, and I think it's what the prime minister is also hearing uh, very solidly from the premiers of uh, uh, mm -hmm. many provinces uh, in Canada right now, including uh, my premier, uh, uh, Francois Legault in Quebec, because uh, restaurants are all opening next uh, next week. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, it's, it's almost going to be business business as usual with a bit of social mm -hmm. distancing, I do hope. Um, so yes, I'm pretty sure they're saying, hey, listen, uh, your CERB uh, uh, program was uh, uh, much needed. They were, they all cried out for it at the beginning, but now we don't want this to be in competition with the uh, uh, the need to get the, the workers back uh, to, to, to work. So I, I do understand this mm -hmm. completely, but we have to also not forget, and that's always my worry, in this type of world we're living in is that we're in a pandemic. We get all confined. Uh, we've all been confined, us included, for the past 70 some some days, if not 80, I stopped counting. Feels like 3 million, but sure, yeah. yeah. <laughs> exactly. So, uh, I mean, it's for reason uh, that we're health related and for our security and security of others. So let's not be too judgmental toward uh, of work who yeah. would, and I, I get the Mr. Singh's point on that matter. There's people who want to make sure that if they're recalled, uh, let's say you work in a restaurant, that the, the restaurant have taken the right measures uh, mm -hmm. to assure your security. So there's still a bit of work to be mm -hmm. done, but I do understand there's a need to now get as, mm -hmm. as close to normality as possible. And how do you get the right balance? It's, it, it's going to be uh, very important to see before we get or don't get a second wave. Yeah, I think that's a great point. First of all, there's the psychological mm -hmm. impact of being confined for the last 13 mm -hmm. weeks, the uh, fear that we all have about a second wave. And I think there are legitimate worries from a lot of workers about how safe it is uh, to, to go mm -hmm. back to work. I totally understand that. Uh, Shakir, talk a bit, about if you, a bit about, if you could, the Conservatives and how they navigate this issue. They took a lot of criticism a, a month ago or two months ago when they were sort of slamming the CERB to a certain extent by saying it disincentivizes uh, people from going back to work. That didn't go over well with a lot of Canadians. How, how do they navigate this issue going forward? Well, I think to that point, I think the CERB actually does disincentivize people to go to work. It's actually 
motivates you to stay home. But I think in this world, there are a lot of workers, for example, during the pandemic, uh, what is the industries that are hit hardest, right? Uh, the service industry, so restaurants, bars, retails. A lot of these folks are going to be very in close contact with other individuals who may be asymptomatic, who may have problems. Uh, and if you're working in those situations, you don't want to have to bring COVID back home to your family, to your friends and whatnot. So I think if the conservatives are probably looking at this, maybe the CERB can be extended, but maybe it's as an insurance policy, right? So maybe if you have COVID or dealing with someone who has COVID-related symptoms, you can actually... Uh, get some of that money to kind of stay home and take care of those of those individuals. But it should not be there as just blanket overall kind of like income for individuals who can kind of weigh the risks of, of going back to work or not going to work. I think ultimately we want to get people back to the workforce. We're trying to restart our economy across the board throughout Canada. And having this program in place just doesn't encourage people to actually go to work, especially when you start thinking about it's very possible the economy doesn't pick up as much, right? If I'm working in a restaurant, maybe I'm not getting as much tips as I, as I once was because the business is not picking up as much. But I think ultimately, when you remove that CERB, uh, you encourage businesses to actually uh, have some serious uptake on the wage subsidy. You get people back into the workforce, and then you have things picking up again for the economy. I guess you just, you know, some would worry about the lack of a safety net for people who who in some parts of this province, for example, in Ontario, can't go back to work or who don't feel safe going back to work. But I take your point completely. Absolutely. I just think it, it needs to be more targeted. It shouldn't just be this blanket approach to for, for all. The politics of this, Amanda, are going to be interesting. We've got sort of a condensed mm -hmm. amount of time in Parliament. Things are supposed to wrap up next week. Uh, right now, based on my, you know, the interview with Mr. Singh, talking to Minister Duclos, like nobody seems on the exact same page. And what's interesting right. at this time, which we, we rarely talk about as much anymore, but it's a minority government, so they they're, they do need to be able to get support from some MPs, some configuration of MPs, or one party, or you know, a multitude of them. We'll see how that goes. But politically, it should. I mean, there will be some interesting negotiations taking place over the coming days. Yeah, for sure. And, you know, I think part of the reason why this was given to opposition parties on the weekend for a pre-study and those negotiations are ongoing is because even when you hear us on the panel, you hear shades of the same story, shades of the same request. And I think part of it is nuance. Like, how can we nuance a little bit so that it doesn't come off as law and order? And how can we make sure that we're incentivizing people back to the workforce and penalizing only those who have truly defrauded the system? And I think if the Liberals are able to make those negotiations with each of the parties, they'll be able to get there because the common good of this is moving more people to the wage subsidy, getting people back to work, stimulating the economy. And frankly, that's what all parties want to have happen. The big problem with the wage subsidy, Francoise, and Amanda alluded to this, is it's not the, the uptake has not been anywhere near what the government anticipated it would be. The last time I checked, and I think the data was from early last week, but they had originally anticipated almost a million people or a million businesses would mm -hmm. apply and be approved. <laughs> a third of that has actually happened. They've, they have they initially budgeted over $70 billion for it, and it ended up being $9 billion right now. They, they adjusted the, the estimates, but still it's not even close to what, I think they reduced it to something like 40 or $45 billion, and we're, we're nowhere near that. We're about $10 billion in. Uh, so that's a big challenge for the mm -hmm. government, and you can hear it reflected in the Prime Minister's remarks every day. He's almost like pleading, businesses, here's a number you can call. Please yes. take us up on the wage subsidy, right? But, but I mean, the rubber will hit yeah. the road eventually if those businesses do not end up taking advantage. They're gonna, the government will have to take a pretty hard look at that program. Well, if when you deal with businesses, you know that they they are busy surviving right now. So sometimes, and uh, uh, a lot of people have businesses, and they know all the red tape and so on and so forth. So I, I'm I'm surprised and not that surprised that uh, the numbers are, are are a bit off from what the government had expected. Uh, there's a lot of people who just didn't have time to do that. As surprising as it as it looks, uh, uh, I've known of uh, of, of business that they've they passed the last uh, 80 some days having uh, phone calls, a video uh, conference with uh, with uh, uh, with different uh, uh, people uh, trying to see how they will get over this, how they can, if they can continue functioning in different ways. Mm -hmm. So they're not necessarily on 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 that uh, on, on that the same wavelength as as the government who's supposed to have time to think, who's got the most specialists mm -hmm. of specialists to try to 
to to be in tune mm -hmm. and maybe that's what we will realize at the end of uh, of the day that you cannot uh, govern by just answering to a cry you hear somewhere you have to have a bit of vision you have to look forward you have to understand the world you're living in and not just react, but uh, really uh, take 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 the le taureau par les cornes and, and go ahead of, of of the curve to make sure that you you have the right program to help the right people, or that you 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 give your message and the people get the message that you want them to give uh, get. That's not everybody in every business that at eleven are listening to the prime minister. Yeah, it's, and it's, they it, don't have time for that. It's interesting because uh, I, I would I. I I would almost characterize that as part of the government's vision, Shakir. Like that's the way they had envisioned okay. it, at least as I interpret it from the, the, the remarks that they've made is the CRB is there for the acute part when the businesses, when everything's shut down, and then you transition people off the CERB through to the wage subsidy, and that's supposed to sort of, as the economies reopen across the country. The problem is that, that it didn't work exactly that way, right? Economies stayed shut longer than we anticipated they would, yeah. and now people are not necessarily taking advantage of that program to reopen and rehire people, I think, at least from what I've heard through my inbox, because of a, still a huge amount of uncertainty about the degree to which they'll be yeah. able to reopen, will they be able to stay open for a long time? How many people can I hire? That kind of thing. Uh, what do you think about that, Shakir? Yeah, no, that, that's exactly the point. I think the degree of uncertainty, and when you're talking about a province, for example, like Ontario, you're also talking about folks who are paying a tremendous amount of rent if, you're, if, you're, if you have a business downtown. Uh, you're not able to, to generate any revenues. So factor into that that you have to th talk about bringing back a, a lot of your employees through the wage subsidy. You're encouraged to pay 25% of that salary. Um, how can you pay 25% of a salary if you're not generating any revenue, right? So I think there's just a lot of uncertainty. Who knows when Ontario is going back to stage two and then the business that even open in stage three. Uh, just a lot of folks are just curious about what happens next and who knows what happens again in, even in September, right? Uh, if we have a second wave, we have to scale back a little bit. So just given um, the regulations in place, the uncertainty of a lot of businesses, uh, the uncertainty with their own employers, whether they're all going to come back at the same time, I think those factors kind of weigh heavily on, on a lot of businesses. And I think uh, there was just a lot of misjudgment as far as the uptake or the immediate uptake of the program. It might have more uptake on the back end of it, but definitely the immediate uptake was, uh, was overshot by the government. And that's really going to depend, Amanda, on how the program is reformed. And, and the government has indicated that there would be some. And, and I specifically talked about, for example, you had to show a 30% decline in revenues. And right. I heard from a lot of businesses who were saying, you know, say a restaurant, right? You're, you, you decide to reform and become takeout and delivery only. So you've got, let's say, 35% of, you know, your, your yeah. revenues just haven't declined to the degree that had to hit there. And so I think especially as they're reopening, right, they're gonna, their revenues will start to increase, but will they still be able to qualify for that help? Those kinds of questions I think will be key to get some answers to. Yeah, and I think that the government was really responsive in that way too. You know, if originally when the program came out, it was 30% year over year. Then they looked at um, the previous three months, which gave a lot of businesses a much better chance of qualifying for that wage subsidy, and in some cases, a 15% reduction. So all of those measures, you know, when you talk about speed, these programs happened at a speed that would be fast for the private sector, let alone the public sector, let alone the government. Um, so there has been adjustments along the way. But I think the biggest challenge in the uptake of the wage subsidy has been reopening. And now, as especially as Ontario uh, heads into phase two, we have way more businesses who are able to open. And, and the hope is that as those businesses open, then more people will come off CERB, will come on to the wage subsidy under their employer, will be incentivized to get back to work. And that's part of the reason why this bill on Wednesday is so critical. Okay, I have to leave it there. Uh, Dr. Bonnie Henry just stepped up to the microphone in British Columbia. Thank you very much to our power panel this evening, Amanda Alvaro, Shakir Chambers, and Francois. Hi, I'm Vashi Capello's host of Power in Politics. See more of our show by subscribing to the CBC News Channel or click the link for another video.